The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. If you're visiting, we are grateful to have you here and be a part of our family to worship the living God. So grateful for you. We're currently in between books. Um, we're going to start up the book of Romans in 2020, and we're hoping to, to finish before Christ returns. So it could be today. I don't know. I hope so. Currently, we're looking at Luke chapter 2, and we've been seeking to really prepare our hearts for Christmas, to look closely and sweetly at the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, the Lord. I've been battling a sinus infection if you're visiting and it didn't go away, but I, someone gave me a new remedy this morning. If you got a good one, come see me. I've tried 73 and we're getting there. <clears throat> so last week we began, if you'll turn to Luke chapter 2, we looked at verses 1 through 7 and the whole passage as Christ comes into this world, it just seems so ordinary. Just the natural process of kings and governors issuing a decree to take a census. And they each has to travel to their own hometown, and and Joseph and Mary have to go, and he has a pregnant wife who comes to full term while they're they're there in this humble little town called Bethlehem that was prophesied some 700 years before that that would happen. And they arrive, and there's no vacancies, and they find a stable. And there in this lowly place, Jesus of Nazareth was born into this world and wrapped in swaddling cloths, and then they laid him in a manger." And yet last week, we, we pulled out of that simple, humble verse, and we looked at the hand of providence, the hand of God that is over this whole simple scene, and it was anything but ordinary in its significance of what took place. And that which had been prepared since the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ, was this birth because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should have everlasting life. And so here's that gift. Here's the, the, the gift of God born in a manger. The path that, that God would pave for sinners to approach in this humble little manger so that no one would stay away from Christ. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest for your souls for I am gentle and humble in heart is this beautiful manger scene. For any sinners here this morning, he's, he's put the bar low that you would come and find this salvation that God has sent into this world. Well, this morning, we're going to look then at God's birth announcement, one of the great blessings of a parent. And once again, it will be alarming. It's humble, it's unexpected, but with great purpose as well as the humble birth. And so Luke just continues to show us that that God came for the sick, the unrighteous, the poor, the lowly. That's who he said, I came for, not the righteous and the healthy. May our text encourage our approach to him once again. I've been praying that every one of you, if anyone is in here that needs that approach, that this morning you would have your eyes open to see the safety of coming to this Savior. So may God take up our hearts to adore the everlasting Lord as we study this birth announcement this morning, let's go to our King and ask Him to meet us in a special way. Father, we come before You and I thank You that You've given us a word that has been inspired. Lord, we hold it as such. It's God-breathed. And so we look at, at every word and we know that it's from You and there's power in Your word. And so I pray now that Your word would be proclaimed. I pray that Your Holy Spirit now would illumine every mind and heart with the truth that is in this passage. And I pray that you will change and transform us from one image of glory to the other. And so meet us here in a special way, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, this passage that we're going to look at this morning really hit me. I guess it almost seems like yesterday to me, June 7th, 1993, uh, the birth of my first son. I I remember what I was wearing. I had on black shorts and a purple shirt, which was 10 years out of date then and would certainly be today. So don't give your pastor trouble for wearing a purple shirt. There was this excitement of carrying my suitcase to the car and knowing we're about to drive to the hospital for our first child. And after a long day at 9.07 p.m., my little boy took his first breath. He was like Sean Killian's little boy. He was a moose right out of the gate. And it was just overwhelming. 
uh, with each kid. It was just the exact same way, but every parent knows that. I'll never forget uh, running out to the waiting room to tell everyone who was there the good news that a son was born to me. And, and later, I, I got out the church directory and I called everybody in the directory. I just, I had to tell them. I was so full of joy, went to the grocery store and I told everybody in the grocery store about it. And there was just such joy in telling people that my son had been born into this world. And this morning, here's God. His son always existed. And he's been loved with an infinite love. They've had eternal fellowship. And his son is now born. He's been telling us for thousands of years in this holy Bible, my son is going to come into the world. I will send him. And all of history has had types and shadows and figures showing us what the son will look like and what he'll do. And now this morning in this passage, the fullness of the time has come this day. Eternity has stepped into time and entered in in a manger. This morning, we're going to look at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, and here's your outline. I want to break it up into three headings as we look at God's birth announcement. In verses 8 through 9, we're going to see some surprising circumstances. In verses 10 through 14, a very significant announcement, and then in verses 15 through 20, just a sweet response to this beautiful passage. So let's take up our first point. Hopefully it's on the screen. Uh, surprising circumstances. Look with me in Luke 2, 8, where we left off last week. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. And so you think this has got to be a scribal error or maybe a manuscript defect. You don't tell the greatest news in the world that has ever been known to some shepherds who are watching their flocks by night. I couldn't imagine when when one of my kids were born, you know, the silence, and I call the local zookeeper, hey, my son has been born. You know, that's not it. Should not this announcement go to Herod? Or maybe to all the princes of the world, at least to the praetorium of Caesar? Maybe all of Jerusalem? I would think the angel at the pinnacle of the temple with a trumpet letting all of Jerusalem know Messiah has been born. You've been waiting forever. In in England, they have babies and the whole country gathers and they come and present them. Or Simba, you know, here's the presentation for everybody to see. And, And so here's God's announcement. It comes at night. It's dark. People are sleeping. It's in the regions of this little town of Bethlehem out in the wilderness And it comes to shepherds. And studying shepherds on the social ladder, they were at the very bottom rung. They were considered unclean men because they didn't keep the Sabbath. They had a lousy reputation. They were known to be thieves. In fact, they couldn't even give testimony in a court in Jerusalem because of their character. They were the lowest paid in society. And right off the bat, the birth announcement then should grip us. Such good news to be shared. The father shares it with some shepherds. The dregs of society at that point. Why? I just want you to take in a couple of verses and I pray it will preach to your hearts. In Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said at that time, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou didst hide these things from the wise and intelligent and didst reveal them to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it was well-pleasing in thy sight. All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and to anyone to whom the Son wishes or desires to reveal him. 1 Corinthians 1.26, Consider your calling, brethren. There were not many wise among the flesh, and not many mighty, and not many noble. Isaiah 61.1, the Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the, the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting. So they'll be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. 
And so what comfort to be drawn just by who God gives the birth announcement to. The greatest announcement to the lowest of low in the society. And it just screams in, in, in verse 11 that unto us a Savior is born. And it's the Savior of mankind. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. The message, I want you to hear this, it's for us. It's suited for the low life. It's suited for the lost life. It's suited for the lonely life. It's suited for the hopeless life. It goes to those who don't have any good news. And this morning, he's going to say, I have good news. Mary said, God is high. And in her Magnificat, she says, but he regards the lowly. This is the way of God. Oh, this is how salvation comes. It comes to the humble and the lowly. This lowly, humble God comes and He invites you now to come humble, broken, not self-righteous. This is the beautiful gospel that went to shepherds. It was born in a manger. Come, come. Don't, don't sit and say, I'm too broken, I'm too sinful. Don't keep away from with that argument or that reason. He's just bidding you by a, by a manger and by shepherds. Come humble. Come broken. And come and receive the Savior of the world that I've set in. And my plan is for the broken to come and get this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It came to shepherds. Our verse says they were staying out in the fields. And this was usually in, from April to November that they would do this. And I, I hate to be a killjoy. Christmas probably wasn't December 25th. Okay? So little kids, it's still fun. <laughs> To celebrate, but it probably wasn't December 25th. It was just a night like any other night. They're out there shepherding. The stars are out. It's most likely a warm night. And look with me in verse 9. The angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. Terribly frightened. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord is standing with them, could be Gabriel. Remember in chapter 1, he came and appeared to Mary and to Zacharias. So it doesn't tell us for sure, but maybe Gabriel comes back. And, and that's overwhelming to see an angel. But if that wasn't enough, the glory of the Lord shone all around him, the Shekinah, the manifestation of God. And they responded the way that everyone who ever got a glimpse of that glory from cover to cover of the Bible it says they were terribly frightened. The Greek word is megas, where we get the word mega, great, large, exceedingly. And so all of a sudden, this glory of the Lord now is shining with these, with these um, shepherds, and they're seeing it, and they're mega frightened. That's been the history of the world. Anyone who has ever seen God, someone told me the day they were reading Isaiah 6 last night, when you see God, you fall as a dead man. John, anyone who sees the glory of this God I'm instantly terrified, and I'm a dead man. All the way up until this day. This day, I want you to listen to the announcement of God. And so our first point is some surprising circumstances that he came to these shepherds. Now I want to look at our second point, which it's just such a significant announcement, is that it's verses 10 through 14. Look with me in verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. And so this is difficult, and it might be very difficult for you this morning. Don't be afraid. And, and some of you have come in, and you're so aware uh, of, of your separation from God and your sin. And some of you have bills that you don't know how you're going to pay. we got several who are battling cancer. I have a friend on the verge of homelessness, a brother who's very sick, a couple in hospice. There's so many things going on. And God says, don't be afraid. I want you to picture a kid standing on top of Niagara Falls. Your kid, and you're at the bottom of it, and you're like, jump, Jimmy. <laughs> don't be afraid. Is that going to take care of the problem? Is that going to do it? That doesn't do a lot for a little kid looking down Niagara Falls. These men are looking at the glory of an all-consuming holiness. They're, they're staring at blazing purity, infinite, 
And they're looking right into it. And they're seeing power beyond description and, and, and a purity that is, is just, un, un, they've never seen anything like it. They see a justice that's unflinching. And now you're standing there with all your sin, all your unrighteousness that flows like Niagara falls out of you. And you're staring at that God saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You're going to have to give me something more than that. (laughs) This is terrifying. How do you get sinful shepherds staring at the glory of almighty God to not be afraid? The one who said to Moses, I will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. We're guilty. We are guilty before this God. He's a consuming fire. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And you're telling me not to be afraid. There has to be an answer. And the answer is Christmas. The answer is Christ the Lord. And the answer is the most beautiful answer ever known to man. It's truly good news. It's the best. It's the best news there is. Look with me in verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Why? For behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which will be for all the people. One of my favorite verses in the Bible now. Rather than mega fear, he uses the exact same Greek word. He says, I, I've got mega joy for you. So exceeding mega fear, and I've got a message of mega joy for anybody sitting here this morning. How do you go from great fear of this God who knows me and is pure and holy to great joy as you look at the most awesome glory that there is? The answer is that this awesome power is not going to be poured out on you to crush you and destroy you, but it's now been given to you to save you. This power has come into the world to save you, not to destroy you. It's not, I'm not going to snap you like a twig, but my power is going to embrace you now like a child through this one who was born into the world. I'm not here to burn you, but to bless you. Not to tear you down, but to build you up into the image of Jesus Christ. Do you get this? He's not any less awesome, majestic, glorious, consuming, or holy. It's just that this God and all of his glory is merciful and gracious. There's an attribute in this God that is merciful. And this baby is the proof of it. A baby in a manger preaches there's a God who's merciful. I I sent my son into the world to save it. So because he's merciful, (coughs) I bring you good news of a great joy which will be for all the people. Great fear of what that power is going to do to you. To great joy because of what that power has done for you in Christ Jesus. If you go look at a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger, you're going to find a Savior, the angel tells them, who is Christ the Lord. This is the instrument that Almighty God has chosen to save the world. To manifest His mercy and His grace just to manifest His glory. And it's in the Son. I want you to hear this. The coming of this child, the Christ event, is the greatest manifestation of God's glory than anything that's ever been seen or known or will be known until He returns. Nothing will manifest His glory more than a baby wrapped in swaddling claws and then hanging on a cross at the end of his stay here on earth. The blazing glory is that he's been born for your good, for your salvation from this power that the angels were looking, that the shepherds were looking into. That's his glory. What you shepherds are looking at is God's glory. And what you fear is what that power will do to you. And some of you are sitting in that fear this morning. And this is what this baby in the manger will do. He will drain that fury on a tree. All the fear and fury in that holy God, that baby is going to grow up and he's going to drain every last drop of it while he hangs on a cross. He'll bear the full wrath of God for our sins. He'll propitiate the wrath of God so that you can be saved from the consuming fire called God. God came to save you from God. 
and to drain it. And this is how mega fear can turn into mega joy this morning. And that's what I want for everybody. It's good news. This glorious God is for me in Christ. He's come near so that I can draw near now to Him and not be consumed by this glory, but to revel in it and delight in it and bask in it all of my eternal days. I can come into it safe, loved, and protected. That's mega joy. That's unbelievable what this gift of this world was for us. Listen to what Bishop J.C. Ryle said. He said, what is, what is it that brings such joy? How do you get mega joy? <clears throat> By the way of pardon and peace that's about to be thrown out there. To pardon and reconcile us with God. Peace with God. Enmity removed. Friendship restored. The head of Satan being crushed. Liberty proclaimed to the captives. The recovery of sight to the blind. Truth to be manifested. A just God can be gracious to the unjust by imputing to them what they do not have. His righteousness. And taking away our sin and imputing it on His Son and, and now punishing it and removing it as far as the east is from the west. J.C. Ryle says salvation then is no longer seen in types and promises and figures and shadows, but all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. The first stone has been laid. The cornerstone has been placed in God's kingdom in a manger in Bethlehem. Cornerstone, right in Bethlehem, and I'll build my kingdom on this Christ. Everything now will be based on Him. So Ryle concludes, if that was not good news, then there's never been any good news that deserved its name. Amen? That's the best news there is. I've been sitting in, in rooms with people dying and they're glowing like angels because of this good news. And it's like they're seeing the face of Christ and they're just wanting to go be with Him. This is unbelievable news, what God has given us in Christ. And so the writer says, Luke, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. This good news, the Greek word is euangelizo. It's where we get the word evangelize, to tell the good news. And this good news is for all the people. It's so comprehensive. It's just suited for everyone. Do you hear it? It's open and offered, and it's offered to shepherds. Come on. It's open to Israel. It's open, he says, to all the peoples. This baby is a flood of mercy upon all the nations who will call upon his name. This beautiful baby, this salvation is for all. Go and tell, spread it. It's good news. Get this news. News, you do not tell people what you need to do. News is what God has done in his son. He's done it all. He's brought salvation. This is the best news that could ever be preached. God himself sent salvation into this world. Oh, joy to the world. Go tell it on the mountain. He sent salvation into this world, and we just sit there with our mouths shut. Verse 11. For today in the city of David, there's been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. <clears throat> today, Luke just loves this word. He uh, when Jesus later uh, comes and he enters in a synagogue and he gets up and reads Isaiah 61, and I just quoted it earlier, that he'll come and bind up the broken. Uh, he, fin he reads it and he says, today, this has been fulfilled in your midst. And he sits down. Then Zacchaeus, the wee little man, gets saved. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. There was a thief hanging on a cross who believes in Jesus, and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today is the day of grace. It's being announced here, and I want you to hear these words for you. There's been a Savior born for you. This is the day of grace. The glory of the gospel is today. One man said, tomorrow is Satan's today. Today, there's been born a Savior in Christ the Lord for all the peoples. To save from sin and all of its effects in your life. All that sin has done to you as you sit here this morning, God sent a Savior to save you from your sin and all of its effects in your lives. As you look back on the history of it and all the destruction and all that's come as a result of sin, I've sent a Savior to come and to save. 
I don't need a good example. I need a Savior. So there's a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Our Savior is the promised one. He's the Christ that was promised for thousands of years. He's the one right away in Genesis 3 that God said would come and crush the serpent's head. He would come and reverse all the effects of the curse of the devil and what came in the Garden of Eden. He is the Almighty God. He's the Lord. He's the one who will sit on the throne of David and be the horn of salvation. This one was the Messiah that we had been waiting and hoping for. And in verse 12, we all like signs, don't we? In, in verse 12, this will be a sign for you, shepherds. You'll find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. So shepherds, I'm going to give you a sign. And what do you expect? Great trumpets, pomp and circus. I mean, an atomic bomb. I just, something great should happen. I got a sign for you of what I just told you is the most amazing news in the world. Uh, in Bethlehem, you're going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling claws and lying in a manger. It just seems kind of anticlimactic of what was just told these shepherds. But that's God's salvation. It begins in a feeding trough. And it's going to finish on a cross and be wrapped in grave, grave clothes in a, a tomb that was borrowed. That's how the gift is going to be wrapped. And the foolish things God uses to shame the wise. And that is the sign, and that's the sign for you this day. And the question is, will you receive it? Will you just be religious all of your life, or will you receive this baby who, who, who uh, grew up and died on a cross and now sits in victory at the right hand of God and is coming again for his bride? Will you receive it? Look with me in verse 13. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men <coughs> with whom he is pleased. So as I look at that, I just see heaven has to cry out. Heaven cannot be silent at this point. And suddenly there's an army of heaven praising God and proclaiming peace. I mean, these shepherds must be so overwhelmed. And, and they're proclaiming glory to God. Glory to God by what has been born in Bethlehem's manger. This birth is the gift of God's love. His love purposed it. His wisdom planned it. His mercy is what characterizes it, and His power carries it out, and His faithfulness will see it to completion. But His Son is the one who will bring its whole fulfillment. He is the one who will fulfill all of this. And so the glory to God for His indescribable gift for what He's given us in Christ Jesus. He is a saving God to the lowly in heart. What a beautiful message. It's the opposite of every religion. It's just, it's, you've you got to achieve and become righteous and do all. The, this is for the lowly and heart of sinners who will come to this one that came to us in a manger. This gospel exalts the glory of God. It just puts him on display. It's all of him. It's his saving. It's his doing. What a God who would do this. And then he says it will bring peace. And I've gone over this a lot, but I'm going to do it again. Is God... With, with us and God, after the fall, there's enmity in his heart. We, we wanted to be God, and we sinned against him and defied him, and we all took original sin with Adam. We're born in the world, separated, haters of God, lovers of self. And so there is an enmity in God toward us with our puny fists, telling him how to run his kingdom, what we want to do, be the captain of our own ship. There's just enmity. And then you come over to man, and there's enmity in our hearts. Because I, I want to tell my, I want to tell God how to run His world. I want to tell Him what I think. I want to do what I want to do. And so you just got this, 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 this eternal enmity, conflict, war that would have never ended. We could have never fixed it. And every religion's trying to fix it, and you can't fix the enmity in God's heart towards sin. For one sin, He has to punish it. You're guilty. So you just, and we don't hold the key. So God sends His Son into this world to be the enmity remover. And he comes and he, he takes all of God's wrath towards our sin and he drains it on the cross. And as we look at the cross of Christ, he drains all the enmity that I had in my heart towards God. And now I have a love to him and a surrender because of how he removed the enmity. And now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Prince of Peace. 
peace with God. Peace now in our own hearts with our accusations and our sin. And peace now with other people. God gets all the glory. Glory to God in the highest. It's so deserved. And we get peace with God in our own hearts and with other people. It's such a glorious gospel. Glory to God in the highest because of the lowly one in a manger. So we have some surprising circumstances in verses 8 through 9. I think the most significant announcement that could ever be proclaimed in verses 10 through 14, I was just glorying in that all week, and I pray that your hearts are full right now with what God announced at the birth of His Son in that little manger. And now there needs to be a response. There needs to be a response to this. You can't just walk out of here and say, that was nice. (laughs) You'll be damned. That isn't nice. This is the gospel to save your soul that lasts forever. And you need to respond to it. You can't walk out and open up presents and sing some hymns and light a little candle and feel happy at this time of the year. You're celebrating your destruction. There needs to be a response to what God sent into this world. And I want you right now at Judgment Day Honesty to look at this response and deal with your own hearts. How did the shepherds respond? How should we respond? Let's look uh, in verses 15 through 16. Uh, Christ is sought, and then we're going to see that Christ is proclaimed. But in verses 15 through 16, he sought. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, (coughs) the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And so the angels go back to heaven. They do the same thing they did before that they were doing on earth, worshiping God. And the shepherds immediately go in haste. They're probably a few miles out from Bethlehem and they go to the stables. It doesn't tell us exactly, but they're trying to find him. And they search stable after stable for him. There's a Savior to be beheld. We must find Him. There's salvation in this one. This is God's saving one. We got to go find Jesus. God's salvation has come into the world. Let us go to Christ. Let's get there. Let's go see Him. And I want you to catch this. They don't go to see a sign in order to believe. They already believe. Listen to the words. Let us (coughs) go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They they have no doubt. Well, let's go see it, man. This is true. God said it. Let's go see it. They believe. They believe. They go to Bethlehem. They find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloth and lying in a manger. Just this beautiful scene. And so this morning, what you should be saying in your heart is, well, I, I can't go to Bethlehem and see a baby. How do I find this salvation this morning? You find this Christ in the preaching of His Word. You find this Christ in His Word. Uh, He is the Word. He's the unfolding of this whole plan. And so right here as this Word is being opened up, this is where you find Christ. And you receive Him. And you believe in Christ the Lord who is our Savior. And so that's where you find Him right now as you sit in your own seat. We don't make a trek to Bethlehem. We make a trek to Christ. who who right now is present by His Spirit. And right now we call upon Him to save us. Let the dear Christ enter in. Amen? He should be sought. Secondly, He should be proclaimed. Verse 17, when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child and all who heard it. There must have been more than Joseph and Mary. All who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. So when they saw the Savior lying in the manger, they proclaimed what had been told to them by the angel about the Savior, Christ the Lord, which shall be for all the people. In verse 18, it appears that they're they're telling many this good news of glad tidings. And so the application is simple. Shepherds, uh, I've seen the Savior. How can I be silent about the glad tidings? How is this just for me? And I just shut my lips and be happy this Christmas. It must be told. They couldn't restrain themselves. They got mega joy. They got mega joy now that a Savior has come into the world for their sins. And this just cuts to the heart of Christianity. We must grow and maintain our long-term joy over salvation. 
Paul said, I'm a minister for your joy. I don't want you to ever lose this gospel and let it get cold and drift and put it up on a shelf. It's to be delighted in and mega joy every day I seek that face in this word. And the fruit of this will be our eagerness to share it. I'll be a debtor to all men like Paul was in Romans to let them know of this sovereign, beautiful grace that has come in Jesus Christ. When we lose our joy over this gospel, you'll become stale. You'll lose your desire and eagerness to share it. And that'll be a sign of the sin in our lives. And, and too many old Christians are more excited about grandkids and their vacations and their friends and their jobs and no compulsion to share the good news. That's a bad state, guys. It's easy to gather and be excited and go into the world and say nothing until your next Bible study. That is not this gospel. These shepherds are our example right here. They heard of Christ. They sought Him with an eagerness. And they told of all that they saw and heard of this great Savior. The joy of a Savior must compel us. The early church had such an overflowing joy that the gospel just went out. There's no shortcuts to evangelism than to be overwhelmed with a God who set His love upon you and sent His Son to be a Savior and to give you peace. That's a life that when you open up, this will come out of your heart. It will come out of your mouth. If sports are what fill your heart, that's all you'll talk about. If the stock market is what fills your heart, it's all you'll talk about. If your kids, that's all you'll talk about. But if Christ is your Savior, He, he must come out. He must be spoken of and declared and told, not forced or coerced, these, these uh, shepherds are sharing this as joyfully and as freely as they knew how. Powerful. So come and look at the sign in a fresh way this day. I want you to look at a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes for you. And I want you to lay hold of this Savior every day. Peter coming to Him as to a living stone. And then by faith, I want you to tell the world of a Savior. And maybe this morning, all of us need to repent especially at this time of year, just getting too busy. Maybe you're too ashamed, too joyless, you're too separated, or you're too mingled with the world to pursue every opportunity that the Lord lays before us of all the opportunities that we'll have. And it's not the numbers, it's, it's our faithfulness. I got a guy in hospice who Every time someone walked into his hospital room, he had to tell them about Jesus Christ. It just, it, 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 wherever I am, I just want to tell people about this. And we got these little Christmas flyers to invite to the Christmas Eve service. Man, get out there, because we're going to tell them the gospel and go compel them to come in to hear the beauty of what God sent to us in that manger. So let me close with the last part. In verse 18, it says that, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds, but Mary treasured all these things, pondering them <coughs> in their heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as he had told them. And so just in the last part, verse 18, many of them heard and wondered, and they, but they just went back to their life. Maybe you, you've heard this story so many times and it's, it's fun this time of year and it's emotional and sentimental, but you just do nothing with it. But in verse 19, Mary treasures these things uh, that I may know him. She calls him her savior in the Magnificat. And so I just want you, what's your response to this Christ? Verse 20, they got to go back to work now. But they go back glorifying and praising God Salvation must end in worship. And then we go back to God and we tell, go back to work and tell of this God, a saving God. Go tell Denver that God holds out the, the white flag in Christ. Peace with whom he is pleased, all who will repent and believe in this Christ. This glory is for you who will believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he'll turn your great fear into great joy of a God who loves and accepts you this morning as a child. Amen? Closing application. This is for free. The application is just marvel at what we just looked at, but this is just, I've been thinking a lot about peace. Now that last peace is, 
You have peace with God because of Christ. You have peace in your heart to no longer have sin accusing you and the freedom of this gospel. And you have peace with others. And the peace with others is probably the toughest because it's the least control that you have. Like uh, uh, Paul said, be at peace with all men as much as possible with you. So I I can't control how other people respond to what I did or if I hurt them, but uh, I can uh, be that I, I pursue peace with all men. And so we come to Christmas, <clears throat> and many times family will get together, and, and the longer I live, there just seems to be tensions in families, and it can be awful. And, you know, every, some people say, I, my family put the fun in dysfunction. <laughs> we're just, we're broken, and it, it's a difficult thing, and I just, I don't want to do it. I really don't want to, and in Ephesians 4.31, I want you to take this to heart this morning. Because of this gospel, Paul said, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And I want you to take that into your marriages and your kids and parents and friends. Um, What a beautiful thing we have in this gospel to be able to forgive and forbear with sinners. That's what this should produce. So what is needed on Christmas is kindness, tenderhearted and forgiveness. And that's the half that you're responsible for. And as God has forgiven you, what I want you to be this morning with this baby, I can't get over what I just preached, is be amazed. Be amazed that God would save someone like you. The secret to forgiveness and kindness and tenderheartedness is being amazed that you are forgiven. I mean amazed that God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus. More amazed at that than how wronged you have been. They shouldn't have done that. Amen, they shouldn't have. I agree with you. But how do you feel tender to someone who keeps pounding you and being rude and hurting you maliciously even? Be amazed that you've been forgiven, not in part, but all of your sins by God. And I know there are biblical reasons to separate in the scriptures. There's a lot of, this isn't covering everything. But I just want you to look at this gospel. And as you enter into some difficult season and difficult moments, I, I pray that you'll have this kind of peace to be able to let these things go. Self-righteousness is not being amazed at your salvation. I get so tired when I hear judgment. I'm cooler than other people. It doesn't exist in the kingdom of God. We've got a baby in a manger going to shepherds, and you're so righteous and better than everybody else. Just stop. Okay? And just marvel that you've been forgiven. And be kind and forgiving. And quit looking down you want to look down on anyone, it's just look at your own heart. Be amazed. How do you, let, how do you not let go of 40 years of grievances by not being amazed at being forgiven? And I pray for a church full of peacemakers in a world that has no peace. And so I pray that this baby that was born in a manger will take your heart over. And it will make you marvel at the glory of God, that He's a saving God. He's merciful and gracious. He's not just holy and just, or we'd be done. Marvel at that. And let that give you peace with God and peace in your heart. What what peace you often forfeit? Peace. And now you can be wronged and defrauded and, and abused in all these different ways, and you have an ability to forbear and forgive. Uh, may Christ... Fill us with the peace that comes from the Prince of Peace this Christmas. And then I, I pray, there's so many of you that this time of year, it brings up so many hurts of loved ones who have gone before you, uh, abuses, things that you faced in your childhood. I just, I, I care about how hard this is for, for many of you. And so I want you to, to look at the Prince of Peace and let that minister to your heart and help you with how hard and difficult these seasons can be for you. There, there's so much peace that Christ wants to give to you during this season. And, 
If any of you are just hurting, lonely, struggling, we just got so many who would be willing to minister and help you. We're going to have some elders up here afterwards with delight to help you and to, to journey. I was talking to a, a, a real sweet man I met this morning for the first time, and he was at a church that if you want to be saved, text this number. And he's like, what happened to humans? And so if you're here and you just need a human who loves and cares and wants to guide and nurture you to this sweet peace, that's what we're here for. Almost everyone sitting next to you is here for that reason. So guys, open your eyes and help each other and minister this glorious gospel this morning. So with that, let me, uh, let's pray. Father, I do pray for these saints that I love so dearly who are hurting and they're missing loved ones deeply at this time of year. God, I pray that your spirit, the comforter, would comfort their hearts with the everlasting reunion that's going to come. God, I would take that over 20 years of this earth any day. And I pray that their hopes would be set on that beautiful day. I pray that no matter what's happened in their lives with who they've lost, I pray that the peace that can, that can pass all understanding, it doesn't even make sense to them. Lord, you can give that. And I pray that that peace would fill them even now. I pray for any unbelievers who still have mega fear. Lord, they can't draw near to you because of their guilt and their shame. I pray that right now you would open their eyes to see that this baby would go up on a cross and he would take away all that anger, all that justice and wrath against sin so that there's none left. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There's not a drop even left for them. God, let them feel safe now to draw near to a God who came in a manger and announced it to shepherds. Let them feel safe and approach to a God who's a saving God. Let them come with repentance and faith and not look to their hands and how they're going to change their lives and clean up. Oh, God, kill them to that this morning. Let them just look to Christ and Christ alone, who's a Savior for all men. God, let them find that even here this morning. And let the saints of God, let their hearts be overwhelmed again with such a beautiful message of what you sent in your Son. God, I thank you for it, and it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.